was the most difficult moment in your tenure as Cabinet Secretary? Well, I think the most difficult moment for me personally was when I had to investigate some of the allegations that were made by Mohammed El Fayed against cabinet ministers, not all cabinet ministers, uh, ministers and MPs, uh, about various forms of uh, corruption. I had to look into those and um, it was made particularly difficult because I was misled by Jonathan Aitken. I was foolish enough to uh, say publicly that I believed his story. And then, of course, in a court case, his story turned out to have been untrue. So I think, you know, if I think back of what was the most <laughs> difficult for me personally, most embarrassing, that was the most uh, difficult episode. And could you explain why, as a cabinet secretary, you were being involved in that uh, legalistic area? Well, because I was advising the Prime Minister on whether ministers had broken the ministerial code. And, of course, in some cases, some of the allegations against uh, ministers or MPs, uh, the evidence is in the government files. Uh, that's not always the case. Now, if, if there are uh, charges of criminal behaviour, well, that's not something the Cabinet Secretary ought to look into. It's something that uh, the police ought to look into. Sometimes um, the right form of an inquiry is uh, judge-led. But when the evidence was internal, and it was a question of advising whether the minister had broken the ministerial code, that sort of thing that the cabinet secretary used to be asked to advise on. There's now an independent advisor to the prime minister uh, on whether ministers have broken the uh, ministerial code, and I think that's rather an improvement. Yeah, indeed. Were there other particularly difficult times, Robin, or episodes in your period as Cabinet Secretary? Oh, yes. Well, I, <laughs> almost every day I had <laughs> difficulties of uh, one sort or another. I, I mean, in some ways, some of the, uh, you know, the most critical was the first Gulf War, when Britain went to war, and... I had to set up a system of support for ministers, um, get, get the Whitehall machine so that it was working in a way that would support the decisions that the ministers had to make. And um, these decisions very often had to be made early in the day. And so what used to happen was that the... Um, the assessment staff in the cabinet office would meet at about 4.30 in the morning. The Joint Intelligence Committee would meet at 6 o'clock. The permanent secretaries would meet at 8 o'clock, 8.30. And the uh, ministers would meet at 10, so that decisions were taken earlier in the day, and also so that we could deal with the, the lobby uh, at, uh, at 11 o'clock. Um, so that was a, obviously a tense and difficult time. Um, when I was principal private secretary before, uh, I'd lived through the miners' strike, um, and the, that, was a, that was a tense time. Uh, so. And that's referring to the period from 1982 to 85, when you were Margaret Thatcher's principal private secretary here in number 10. You were also there in the Grand Hotel in Brighton, I think, when the bomb went off. Can you tell us about that? Well, it was during the Conservative Party conference, and of course, the principal private secretary has not got no part to play in a political, uh, the political affairs of the party conference. But uh, I used to attend. I think my predecessors uh, attended in order to carry through the government business, because the prime minister has to go on doing government business. And also, there's part of the party conference speech that uh, parts of the speech that have to be cleared uh, with uh, Whitehall to make sure that uh, what's being said is right. Anyway, um, Mrs. Thatcher used to work long into the night um, before completing her party conference speech. And on this particular occasion, she actually finished quite early. She finished, uh, by her standards, she finished at about 2.30 in the morning. And I had a document that uh, Number 10 wanted to get a decision from her on by breakfast next morning. So I said to her, would she take this and look at it overnight and uh, let me know what her decision was in the morning. By this time, all the speechwriters had left the room and it was just uh, 
she and I in, the, in her sitting room in the Grand Hotel. And she said, if you don't mind, I'd like to look at it tonight and then I can concentrate on my speech overnight. So uh, she was sitting in this armchair about as far away as you are and looking at this document and uh, I was sitting in an armchair facing her just thinking how nice it would be to get to bed quite soon. And uh, while she was looking at the piece of paper, a, um, the, there was this loud explosion. And uh, I'd heard several bombs in my time at uh, number 10. I'd heard the Price Sisters bomb during uh, Ted Heath's time, the bomb that blew up uh, Erin Eve, the Carlton House bomb. So I knew at once what it was. And so I came to rather rapidly and thought, well, now, here you are with the loan with the Prime Minister. Somebody is trying to blow her up, so you better do something sensible. So I uh, said to her, um, I think you ought to come away from the windows in case there is another bomb. Now, the extraordinary thing was that the lights didn't go out. Um, so the lights uh, stayed on by some extraordinary chance. And we went across the room, and um, she said, I must see if Dennis is all right. And so she opened the door to the bedroom, and through the door of the bedroom, you could hear the sounds of falling masonry, which was actually the bathroom ceiling collapsing. And what I should have done is to say, stand back, Prime Minister. Uh, I'm more dispensable than you are. I think I should go and see. But not wishing to stand between a lady and her bedroom, I let her go in. And uh, it seemed like minutes, but it was only a few seconds. And she emerged with um, Dennis Thatcher pulling flannel trousers over his pyjamas. And we went out into the corridor, and uh, as we looked up the corridor, we saw what looked like smoke coming uh, out of the door of the rooms two doors along, which I knew were Geoffrey Howe's rooms. I thought, oh gosh, it looks as if there's been a bomb in Geoffrey Howe's room. But then <laughs> the door beyond opened, and out came Geoffrey um, in his dressing gown, blinking. Anyway, we stood there in the uh, corridor, and I said to uh, Margaret Thatcher, um, well, there's been a bomb. Um, I think what I ought to advise you to do is we must get you back to London. And she said, I'm not leaving. And at that moment, a fireman arrived and said, uh, follow me. And we followed him and uh, took us down the corridor and we got to the end of the corridor and it was a cul-de-sac. So he said, follow me back. And we went along and as I say, the lights were still on and we went down the stairs in the Grand Hotel and... Uh, the, where the foyer had been was full of rubble. And so my next assumption was that the bomb had been placed down there. And Margaret Thatcher broke off to see if everybody who was uh, in the front desk was accounted for, which they were. And then we went out of the back where there were number 10 cars. And the police contingency plan worked very quickly, moved very quickly into action. Uh, but at that point, I thought, well, now, all the number 10 papers are lying uh, about upstairs. And uh, also, um, the Prime Minister's clothes and my clothes and so on. So with one of the Prime Minister's detectives, I went back up, not realising that the hotel was hanging by a thread above our heads. And I packed away the number 10 papers, and I packed her clothes and my clothes and Dennis's clothes. And we went down and uh, we joined the car and caught up with the party at uh, Hove Police Station, where by this time the good and great of the land in various stages of undress were being collected uh, up. And I remember at that point I um, th thought that uh, people, it would be helpful if um, number 10, switchboard, rang pe people's rel relations and so on, so that when they heard the, t the 7 o'clock news, they'd know that um, their loved ones were safe. So I collected the names of those who'd like to uh, have, be, have their relations rung up, and I rang the number 10 switchboard and asked them to do it, but <laughs> unfortunately they, certainly in my case, misunderstood the instruction and my wife was fast asleep in bed at uh, four in the morning and the telephone rang and the number 10 switchboard said, we just want to uh, let you know that Robin's all right. And she said, very kind of you, but I never supposed he was. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, by the time the, by the, uh, by the, time the um, seven o'clock news came on, uh, she knew. And she was calm and resolute? 
extraordinarily. So it was one of those moments where there can be no prepared reaction. You react, as it were, by instinct. Her first instinct was to see if her husband was all right. The second instinct, when we'd got to the Lewis Police Training College, where they took us to, and I turned, she, there was a room for her, and she went there, and uh, Dennis uh, also had a room. And I slept on the bench in the day room uh, where there was a telephone. And after we'd been there for about half an hour, the telephone rang, and it was John Gummer, the chairman of the party, saying things are much worse than we'd supposed. They've already found some people dead. And if you turn on the television, um, the cameras are here. They're digging for Norman Tebbit and John Wakeham. And so I thought, well, shall I wake the Prime Minister up? And then I thought, no, I'd better let her get some sleep. It was by this time five after five in the morning. And um, I turned on the television, watched Norman Tebbit being brought out, who was still digging for John Wakeham. And at eight o'clock in the morning, Mrs. Thatcher appeared, and I said, it's much worse than uh, we suppose. And uh, Norman Tebbit and John Wakeham are seriously injured, and um, Roberta Wakeham is dead, and Margaret Tebbit is seriously injured, and the McLeans are dead. And uh, she hardly hesitated for a moment and said, well, it's eight o'clock. The conference must begin on time at nine o'clock. And I was appalled. I said, surely you can't go on with the conference. Um, you know, you're, some of your closest colleagues have been killed and others are injured. And she said, without any hesitation, we must show that terrorism can't defeat democracy. And of course, she was right. And so the conference did start at nine o'clock. She was on the platform, dressed in the clothes that uh, I'd brought out of the Grand Hotel, uh, looking like a new pin. And she said, here we are, uh, shaken but not daunted. And uh, it was a marvellous gesture of strength. That was one of the most remarkable moments in post-war premiership for the Prime Minister being so tested. Uh, um, towards the end of your time back as cabinet secretary, and just to take one more episode, um, Lady Diana was in Paris. Um, how much did you see personally of that whole drama? Well, I it wasn't rung up in the middle of the night. So I, my wife and I woke at 6.30 in the morning and turned on the radio. And uh, there was an account of, um, said the princess uh, died and something about her life. Didn't say Princess Diana. And my wife and I at first uh, thought it was, they were, it was a historical thing about Princess Grace of Monaco. Anyway, it soon was clear. And so then I had to decide what to do. So. I rang up Robert Fellows, the Queen's private secretary, who was also, of course, uh, Princess Diana's uh, brother-in-law. Uh, and I got, actually, on the phone, um, Princess Diana's sister, uh, Jane Fellows, commiserated and said, uh, you know, what, 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 what was to be done? What could be done? And the immediate thing was that Robert was uh, preoccupied with that I was getting a Queen's flight plane out to Paris and to um, collect uh, Diana's body and bring her back. And then um, in the course of the day, there were other things where, where the body would lie, um, whether there would be a uh, memorial service um, before the funeral, whether it would be a state funeral. And uh, those were the things that we were, we were preoccupied with during that day. And, uh, then after that, I wasn't really uh, very much involved. Um, the palace uh, managed a lot of that week. And uh, my most striking memory of the week was um, another permanent secretary ringing me up and saying, um, I think it must have been on the Tuesday evening or the Wednesday evening, you must walk across the park and see what's happening in the Mall. It's a most extraordinary event. 
and so I did. I walked across St. James's Park and, uh, and it was amazing because there was complete silence in the Mall, complete silence, and yet thousands of people lining up to put their tributes down. And I've never seen anything like it. There's never, I don't think there's ever been anything like it. Uh, but it was, the, it was the silence of the crowd that was the most extraordinary thing. Was the job of principal private secretary essential or merely very helpful for that of being cabinet secretary? Well, it was certainly very helpful. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say it's essential. I think people could be cabinet secretary perfectly well without it. Um, and, um, but really knowing how number 10 works and the central machinery of government works uh, is, of course, uh, enormously helpful. Uh, in some, in one respect at least, um, I think you can be misled having been a principal private secretary because you're no longer, when you're cabinet secretary, just the prime minister's servant. Uh, you're the servant of the whole cabinet. You're that little bit more detached. And um, of course, when I came back as cabinet secretary, it was the same prime minister. Margaret Thatcher was still prime minister. And I had to get used to the idea that I wasn't a member of the number 10 family in quite the same way. Did I, you ever feel just a little bit jealous of, um, of not having that very close proximity to the Prime Minister? Yes, um, I did. I found that quite uh, difficult in, in some ways um, because um, at that, by that time, it was coming to the end of Margaret Thatcher's time, she was very dependent on um, Charles Powell in particular and uh, Bernard Ingham. And I certainly didn't have quite the same standing and influence with her that I had when I'd been her principal private secretary. So how would you describe the job of cabinet secretary? Well, I think my predecessor, Robert Armstrong, described it in, as well as I could, which he, he described it as the chief engineer in the ship of state, um, making sure that the machinery works, that the prime minister and the ministers on the bridge, the cabinet, pull the levers, and that they're connected up to something, and that um, the government... Um, responds uh, and uh, so to make sure that the business of government uh, is carried through is presented in the most helpful way to the cabinet and to um, the prime minister and that uh, decisions get taken in a timely way and then get acted on. Did the nature of the job change during your 10 years at it, a long time, and serving three different prime ministers, quite unusual for a cabinet secretary. Yes, and of course it changed with the prime ministers um, because Margaret Thatcher, by the time I became cabinet secretary, was very well established, was predominant uh, in the cabinet, had a huge national and international uh, reputation. And um, I think was m more tired than when I served her as principal private secretary, understandably. And the form which her tiredness took was not that she was um, any less acute, but she wasn't as keen to argue long into the night as she had been uh, previously. Uh, and so she was a bit shorter with a bit more abrupt in taking decisions and a bit more dependent on other people in her uh, private office. Uh, and, in, you know, and one could say that in the end that was her undoing over both Europe and the, uh, and the council tax, the community charge. Um, so that, that was how she was when I became uh, cabinet secretary. And then John Major arrived, whom I knew well because uh, 
when he first entered the cabinet, I'd been uh, the second permanent secretary in the Treasury dealing with public expenditure, and he was chief secretary. So we worked very closely together, knew each other well, shared a passion for cricket. And um, so, uh, but he, I think, wanted to establish, he wanted to re-establish cabinet government. He wanted to be less dominant in the cabinet. He wanted to encourage uh, cabinet discussion. But by this time, um, and particularly with the divisions over Europe, the cabinet wasn't as self-disciplined as it should have been. And uh, there were a lot of leaks, uh, and uh, these were damaging to the government. Um, There were also the accusations of sleaze, uh, which were uh, very uh, difficult uh, for him. Uh, And um, more his... His position as uh, Prime Minister was really secured by uh, his winning the 1992 election. But then that was followed, of course, by uh, Black Wednesday and uh, a lot of things that shook the government. So he had a, he had a difficult uh, time. He ran for re-election without resigning as Prime Minister. He ran for re-election as party leader in uh, 95. Um, and he, he won that. Um, that was a, quite a shake-up in the, in the government. And then he almost, in my view, fought the 1997 election single-handed. I mean, he, he, it was a terrific performance, but uh, you know, he knew that the Conservative Party were doomed in that uh, election. And then, of course, Tony Blair arrived, and that was a very exciting time. Um, for all the civil service, because it was a change of government after 18 years, we wanted to show that we would serve a Labour government as uh, committedly as we'd served the Conservative government. We didn't know them as well. I wanted to manage the transition to the new government uh, smoothly. Uh, and, um, and, and so, you know, that was a challenging but also um, exciting time. And... Um, I, was, I felt very fortunate, really, because I had eight months of, uh, the, uh, of the Labour government. If we hadn't got on well together, well, you know, they didn't, weren't going to keep me forever. Actually, I think, personally, anyway, I got on extremely well with uh, Tony Blair. He thought the transition went well. He was grateful and kind uh, to, to me personally. Uh, and so, you know, I, I left feeling... I'd really left at the right time and had a very good time. And the task of managing the home civil service also, if the job of cabinet secretary is not enough, how did you possibly manage that on top of it? By having very good lieutenants. And by, of course, you know, the politicians aren't here all the time. So uh, Fridays were days when I could get out to uh, go around and visit the civil service could do it in the uh, recesses as well. Um, so I didn't think, I didn't think that uh, it was impossible. And uh, I also thought, actually, that it was an advantage to the civil service that, as cabinet secretary, I had very good access to the prime minister. Because, of course, you know, senior politicians, I mean, however conscientious, don't find management the most exciting thing that they... Uh, have to do. Uh, but I could, you know, uh, Robert Armstrong, Richard Wilson, Andrew Turnbull, um, could all uh, deal with the management issues uh, affecting the civil service at their weekly bilaterals or at other times because they had such easy access to the Prime Minister. So I thought that actually that, uh, that, that helped and uh, that, was, that, that was possible. Um, it, what it did do, of course, meant it was the, one of the most difficult things was the cabinet secretary is a behind the scenes post. But when you're head of the civil service, you've got to have a bit of profile. You know, you've got to stand up for the civil service and you've got to represent them. And uh, so combining these two things can be difficult. It, I didn't find combining them difficult in terms of the time or the demands. But, uh, you know, that um, uh, 
as it were, standing up for the civil service in public, um, while at the same time trying to do a behind-the-scenes uh, job as cabinet secretary, uh, was a bit more difficult. And what advice did your predecessor, Robert Armstrong, give you in 1988? Well, I don't remember him giving me any particular advice, but of course, I was his boy, I was his lad, he, I was his protege. He'd been my mentor over many years. Um, he was principal private secretary in number 10, 1972, and he really secured my appointment as a, one of the private secretary team in 1972. Uh, so I'd worked very closely with him between 1972 and 1975. And um, then um, in 1982, he was the cabinet secretary, and so uh, I was when I came back as principal private secretary, um, there he was, and we worked very closely together again. So really, by 1988, uh, I'd learned just about everything that I could <laughs> learn from him, and I don't think there were, I don't remember any specific advice at that moment when I took over. And did you have Robert Armstrong, or perhaps any of the earlier? Cabinet Secretaries, Edward Bridges, Norman Brooke, John Hunt, Buck Trend, as, as exemplars in your mind about the kind of public uh, service leader you wanted to be? Well, yes, up to a point, I think. Um, I hugely admired Burke Trend, uh, who, um, you know, he was le struck me as, as lean, ascetic, devoted to the job, not looking for any frills, no self-indulgence, very self-disciplined. Uh, and so I, uh, I took, but my brief, my main model um, was Robert Armstrong, whom I'd uh, seen at, uh, at, at first hand. But the job changed, particularly the head of the civil service job changed um, by the time I came in because the government was just launching a big reform of the civil service um, called the Next Steps Initiative. And this was a very big project, which really involved making changes across the whole of the civil service, turning the executive roles of the civil service into agencies, um, very often run by people who were recruited from uh, outside, I think about half the chief executives of the agencies were recruited from outside and half from inside, and a concentration on their delivering the results that the government had set them to, uh, to achieve. And uh, so that really started pretty well at the moment that I became head of the civil service in 1988. I had an absolutely wonderful lieutenant who, um, as it were, drove that, called uh, Peter Kemp, who had been in the uh, Treasury as well as in departments, and he knew how to drive them. And with a big initiative in Whitehall, it's very difficult, of course, to get the machine going. There's some inertia that you have to overcome. But I was lucky in that um, I had 10 years to do it, and the government remained committed to the programme. And so we did manage to uh, get it established. We had 75% uh, of the civil service were in the agencies. I think that um, it did improve the services that the agencies delivered to the public. So that again, you know, I found a very worthwhile thing and an enjoyable part of the job. So a strong public face required for the head of the civil service part of the job, but a, a, a retiring face for the cabinet secretary. Somewhat difficult to have both faces. But yes, you... and of course, sometimes it went wrong. Um, when I was having to uh, look into the behaviour of uh, uh, the ministers, um, I had to, uh, you know, I got a certain amount of very unwelcome public profile uh, out of that. And then, of course, there were, you know, there was... The, what was developing um, had developed, but uh, was the giving evidence to Parliament to uh, select committees. And then during the latter part of my time as Cabinet Secretary, sort of second half, was the Scott inquiry into the export of arms to Iraq, which had a very high profile. And I think that a lot of the media 
hoped that, you know, well, I didn't say hoped, but thought that might be Watergate and uh, terrible skullduggery on the part of the government was going to be uh, revealed. And uh, so they were always looking uh, for that. And uh, that went on for three years. Um, and uh, so that took up quite a lot of time and involved a certain amount of, um, of, of public expo exposure. Um, <laughs> I remember you, I think Private Eye had a story headlined, it was the butler what did it. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, was, I was quite clear that I hadn't, I hadn't done anything that I had to be worried about and that gave me confidence. But nonetheless, uh, you know, they, we were all under very, very, uh, very intensive scrutiny. Did you sit there in that uh, rather grand office in uh, the cabinet office and, and uh, look at the portraits of previous cabinet secretaries and think I am the most powerful public servant in the land? And did you, did you have a real sense of pride and sense of history in that job? Well, I think I had the latter two. Um, I don't think I had any great sense of, uh, of power um, because, of course, you know, one of the things is that um, the permanent secretaries, the other permanent secretaries, have their own responsibilities to their secretaries of state. Um, it's not for the cabinet secretary to uh, boss them about. Um, and so you're really leading a team rather than having any uh, great power. Um, but I certainly did have a sense of pride in the post and in the civil service. I was very, you know, I've never regretted having become a civil servant. Um, I uh, always thought that our civil service um, had very high standards and I was very proud to be head of it. Uh, and I certainly had a sense of history. And, you can't avoid having a sense of history as you sit both in the cabinet office with the conference room, the treasury boardroom just opposite where um, King George III used to meet his ministers in the 18th century. Um, the room, the cabinet secretary's room is over the site of the old cockpit where um, the, uh, in, the t in Tudor times uh, the, there were the um, sports were, were held, you're in a palace, and then you come into number 10, and all the things that have happened here since it became the Prime Minister's residence more than 250 years ago. You think of Churchill at the uh, beginning of the war, meeting Chamberlain of Halifax, you think of Churchill at the end of the war. Um, so you can't help having a very strong sense of history. And that uh, adds, I think, to one's pride in the, in, the, in the post. But in terms of power, no, I don't think that you know, people uh, say, oh, this is the most powerful position in the country. It didn't feel like that. And I was always looking for, you know, as far as sort of trying to get my colleagues in the departments to do what the Prime Minister wanted them to do, I was always looking for sort of means of leverage to um, make that happen. Uh, and there were, of course, things that um, one could do for them in return for them doing things for you. And um, I was always looking for those. It's um, sometimes suggested that this is no longer an appropriate office for the Prime Minister because it's too small. Could you imagine the British Premiership anywhere else other than in number 10? No, I couldn't. And um, I think that um, the fact that number 10 is a house rather than a department is a terrific asset. Um, because um, the lines of communication to the Prime Minister from the people who work in number 10 were always very short. And, um, you know, there weren't people sort of falling over each other trying to uh, get their message through to the Prime Minister. Uh, I'm not sure that things aren't uh, are quite like that these days. I think there are far, far more people here. But when I first came to work in Number 10 in 1972, 
There were five people in the um, private office. There was the um, Prime Minister's political uh, private secretary in the room on the other side of the cabinet room. There was the press office and there was the appointments office. Uh, and there was the garden rooms and the messengers. And that was about it. And uh, there was a terrific sense of, uh, of family, uh, of um, being involved intimately in a very important uh, operation. And I think it worked really well uh, like that. Um, I think that um, one of the things, however, that involves is that number 10 mustn't try and second guess the departments, of course. I mean, the Prime Minister will want to have his own or her own views, but um, you have, if you're a very small office, to rely a lot on the Secretaries of State and their advice, and that's in my view as it should be. Mm. Collective Cabinet responsibility. You've referred there to the problems of keeping confidentiality within that Cabinet uh, room. Did that principle change during your time as Cabinet Secretary or indeed your whole involvement in your career from 1972 when you first came into this building? Well, uh, people said, you know, has Cabinet um, government broken down? And um, I think in some ways, it has. of course, it has changed because the focus on the Prime Minister has become much stronger. I always used to say that um, the Prime Minister had four sources of power. One was the power of hiring and firing, um, which, of course, is a very strong power and had existed, um, though it's not always quite as unconstrained <laughs> as one might uh, suppose. Uh, of chairing the cabinet and the, running the cabinet committees. Um, and those, in a sense, had always been there. But as time has gone on, there were two more powers that uh, become very important. One is that the prime minister is very much more involved in foreign affairs. You know, in the old days, if you wanted to communicate with the head of another government, um, Instructions were given to the Foreign Office. They sent a telegram to the ambassador. The ambassador would seek audience with the other government, report back to the Foreign Office, and it would come back. To now the Prime Minister picks up a telephone, and uh, an awful lot more happens from here. And because travel is so much easier, there's an awful lot more personal relations and personal visits on uh, both sides. And, of course, the other thing is the media. Uh, you know, you've got 24-7 media very much more concentrated on the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's press secretary has become a very much more dominant figure um, within uh, Whitehall on behalf of the Prime Minister. So the focus on the Prime Minister has definitely increased. However, it doesn't follow from that, in my view, that um, the government has got to become a presidency, and I think it's a very bad thing if it does. Some of the worst decisions, some of the worst mistakes that I saw government make during my time, both as a private secretary and as cabinet secretary, were when things, for one reason or another, hadn't been discussed in the cabinet. Very often because it was thought they were too confidential to uh, discuss. And if you don't discuss things in the cabinet, um, three things can go wrong. One is that you can overlook some part of the decision that affects a bit of government that you haven't thought of. Whereas if you'd discussed it, the minister for that department would have been alerted to it and uh, would have raised the point. The second is that um, very often, ministers who are directly dealing with uh, an issue, it's a very important issue, get almost too close to it. They lose their perspective. And to have the advantage of some advice from other politicians, senior experienced politicians who can see things more generally, I think is uh, important. And the uh, third thing is ministers who have not taken part in a momentous decision, don't feel bound by it. 
and although they may conventionally be bound by collective uh, responsibility, if they disagree with it, the, the, the government is more fragmented and uh, divided. So I think that uh, cabinet uh, government um, remains very important. It is more difficult to achieve in a very much faster moving world, but not impossible. And uh, my advice to a prime minister would be to um, make sure that uh, collective government continues. Would you have other items of advice for a modern prime minister in the 21st century? Yes, I would. <laughs> Go on. And, well, I mean, I think, I think the most important thing is not to uh, take too much notice of the media uh, because they will push you about and uh, they will demand immediate responses and immediate responses are often wrong. And my model in that respect was Margaret Thatcher who didn't uh, like reading the media um, when there was a story that she had to answer in the House of Commons, Bernard Ingham had to say, Prime Minister, you may not want to, but you've really got to read this because you're going to be asked about it uh, this afternoon. The one thing she did do was to listen to the Today programme while she was having her hair done in the, uh, in the morning. But uh, in general, she didn't uh, read the media, and so she wasn't uh, pushed about by them. If you were watching the television with her, uh, she'd turn it on because perhaps there'd been an air crash or something had happened. When the next bit was about uh, her, the Prime Minister, she would always turn it off. She couldn't bear to watch herself on the, on the, on the television. Um, so anyway, I, I think that. And then my other piece of advice, which is really connected with that, is lead, don't follow. The, dif the difference being... Well, because um, if you try to give people uh, what they want, they always want something different every five minutes. <laughs> and uh, so it's best to have a firm direction that you're going in, firm principles, and then people will follow. Mm. They may not li like it, and um, you may get a lot of uh, criticism and attack. But uh, nonetheless, people like to be led. Actually, as a civil servant, I like to be led. I very much preferred a strong minister, a strong politician, to a, uh, to a, a weak one. Do we have the same quality of leadership in both uh, uh, ministers and civil servants as when you first entered the civil service? Well, all ministers and all senior civil servants are, are different. And uh, I, when people say, you know, which of the prime ministers that, that I worked for did I admire most, not ducking the question, I always say, well, nobody becomes prime minister of this country without having very great uh, qualities, but they're different qualities. And um, so it's, you know... And, and they all did, all the ones, all the Prime Ministers that I worked for um, did have great talent and, but, but, but different qualities. Uh, now, is the, quali well, is the quality of leadership the same? Yes, I mean, I don't think it's diminished anyway. I think it's very much more under strain because of 24-7 media. You know, when you think of Harold Macmillan <laughs> saying being Prime Minister was the easiest job he ever had and he spent a lot of time reading Trollope and Jane Austen, it's an illustration of how things have changed. And what is the, the, the magic ingredient of true leadership? Ah, well, um, it, it's knowing where you want to go and s your troops knowing where you want to go and knowing that you're not going to retreat at the first sound of gunfire. And moreover, that when they are trying to do what you, they believe you want them to do, that you will stand by them. And did Mrs Thatcher ever shout at the Today programme at the radio uh, if she disagreed with it? No. <laughs> <laughs>
I think Dennis shouted, <laughs> but uh, I don't remember <laughs> Margaret Thatcher ever. Uh, I think she would have uh, tutted, oh, these people. But I don't think, uh, you know, I, I mean, all forceful though she was, I can't remember her ever shouting. You've met so many interesting people, it would be impossible to, uh, to pick, I imagine, um, two or three who, who most struck you. But I'm going to ask you to do it nevertheless. Well, yes, you're right. I met so many. It was a privilege. I met so many interesting people and, of course, famous people and powerful people and so on. But I think if I look back on it, the people I think of who interested me most were people who had had experiences that I could hardly imagine. And so if I had to pick out three people, I would say Nelson Mandela, Oleg Gordievsky, and Deng Xiaoping. I'm going to ask you to say a word about each of those, if you would. Well, you see, can you, can you imagine um, Nelson Mandela having spent all those years on Robin Island, having been treated brutally in many respects, his eyesight and his health affected, uh, and yet coming out of it uh, and taking the statesman-like charitable role that he did. I couldn't imagine myself uh, doing it. Oleg Gordievsky living for so many years uh, in acute danger of being uh, detected. A, 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 a person who spied because he didn't believe in the system and he did believe in the Western system, an ideological uh, spy who took risked his life every day for it. And Deng Xiaoping, who had been imprisoned in China, had lived through the Cultural Revolution, and had then come out and uh, was leading this uh, huge, huge country. You can't meet those people and not be fascinated by them. And to conclude on incidents, um, the 1974 general election um, amidst strikes in the country, a, a, a very vexing time for Britain. Uh, what was that, what was number 10 like at that time of that February 28th election in 74? Well, of course, it was fraught and it was under siege. Um, the crowds could come into Downing Street then and uh, did and were chanting Heath out and so on. And, uh, you know, up and down the country, there were fights between the miners and the, uh, and the uh, police. Uh, we in Number 10 were working 18 hours a day uh, in support of the government. And then, just speaking as a civil servant, um, Labour come back in. The first thing Harold Wilson says was settle the strike. I mean, we've been, I'd been, in particular, I was the economic private secretary then, I'd been writing speeches for um, Ted Heath about how important it was that the uh, government's law on prices and incomes was upheld, who rules Britain. And um, so it was a great trauma, really, to find yourself then having to write speeches saying almost exactly the opposite. Uh, but it brought home to me the role of a civil servant. You work for the government that, uh, that has been elected. But also, you know, it also brought home, because uh, I was very fond of and admired Ted Heath. And it brought home something I think that people find in number 10 a great deal. You, you, you support the prime minister, you admire the prime minister, you do your very best for the prime minister, you're close almost intimate relationship develops. And then a week before a general election, you look at each other and the Prime Minister suddenly realises that you, who he's trusted and liked and is going to be working for his or her chief political opponent in, in a week's time, 
that's quite a moment, actually. And, uh, but it's something that you've got, to, you've got to get used to. So, yes, that was a very fraught time. But I suppose the other, you know, the incident we haven't mentioned in number 10, um, which in a sense was uh, one of the most memorable, was the mortar attack. And um, sitting in the cabinet room, there was a meeting going on of the Gulf War cabinet. I was sitting next to John Major. And um, what I remember clearly, I don't think it's come out in any of the memoirs, was what we were worried about was Iraq might uh, launch a terrorist attack in uh, London. And the last word I remember John Major um, uttering before the... uh, before the mortar bomb exploded, was the word bomb. And suddenly, there's this bomb, the room shakes, the windows um, shiver, shatter. Not, not shatter, but uh, craze. Uh, the French windows at the cabinet, end of the cabinet room blow in. And what I immediately supposed had happened was that this was a terrorist attack and there was people had come over the back wall and they were going to appear at the cabinet window spraying submachine gun uh, at us. And uh, so I got under the table pretty quick. I found John Major was under the table beside me. And um, but quite soon it was clear that hadn't happened. And we got up and restored what dignity we could. But then um, Charles Powell said, put into action the drill again, and the drill was Prime Minister, number 10 under attack. You got the Prime Minister to a safe area, and that happened very quickly. And we did get the Prime Minister to a safe area, and since it was a safe area, I followed him as closely as I could and got into the safe area too. And then after about 10 minutes, it was clear that there was no follow-up attack. Uh, we didn't know that there'd been a mortar shell. We thought it had been, at that time, we thought it had been a bomb, a uh, car bomb outside the back wall of number 10. And um, we went through to uh, the cabinet room to Cobra, Cobra and resumed the meeting. And it wasn't for another 20 minutes, half an hour, that we were told what the nature of the attack had been. And of course, mercifully, nobody was killed. Um, the worst thing that happened was some people, one person got a cut in the back of their scalp through a piece of flying glass. Uh, And that was the worst that happened. But um, it was another memorable moment. Uh, And let's finish uh, with um, the transition in uh, May 1997. John Major talking to everybody in this room here. um, and, uh, And then his successor arriving. What can you recall of that? Well, it was a beautiful day. And of course, uh, there were all the crowds outside um, waving the flags and so on. And um, I was standing outside the cabinet room. The number 10 staff were lined up either side of the front door in the traditional way. And I think it was best summed up by the Blairs coming in, the Blair family, and um, Tony Blair acknowledging the clapping and so on, and then there was one of the garden room girls with tears pouring down her face. And she, he stopped and said, what's the matter? And she said, oh, well, you're very welcome, but I do so miss that nice Mr. I'm going to miss that nice Mr. Major so much. And of course, Tony Blair entirely understood. Mm. And um, I shook hands, I received him at the end of the corridor, shook hands with him opened the door of the cabinet room, went in. As I say, it was a beautiful day. And so we went and sat in the wicker chairs outside on the uh, top of the steps uh, overlooking the garden and set about the things that a prime minister immediately has to do, which is uh, making his most uh, senior appointments. And Mr Blair, as understandably apart from the rush of adrenaline, was absolutely exhausted. And um, the American system is crazy when uh, you have three or four months you know, of a lame duck president while the administration gets itself together. But our, our, our system, when you have two hour, or three hours sleep 
after you've been going around the country campaigning for three, four, five weeks, this is uh, even more crazy. And do you miss it all here? I'm not a missing person. Uh, I'm just lucky in that respect. Um, I'm very pleased and proud to have uh, worked here. I feel very privileged. But uh, it's just always been in my character that I get excited about the next thing. So I, I wouldn't apply to come back. And the next thing is Twickenham, England against Australia tomorrow. It, at the moment it is, yeah, yeah, <laughs> good. yeah, good. Lord Butler, thank you very, very much indeed. Great pleasure. Thank you.